Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Victor Rodriguez, and welcome everyone to the ELC 2020. Um, today, I'm going to present about tool change in the new area, how to update safe. My name is Victor Rodriguez, and I'm going to be um, talking this time about this impressive topic that I really enjoy and hope that you really enjoy too. So, a few months ago, before all this chaos of around December, November, one of my friends told me something really amazing that uh, he found amazing at that moment that I didn't really realize before. And it was how much work the GNU Toolchains community actually do every year, right? And I was like, okay, we have two releases in GLibc every year, around the beginning of the year and end of the year. And we, we have one release every year for the GCC compiler. We have GCC 10 a few, few months ago in, in May, a few weeks ago. But it was something that he told me. He said, you know, the community is very uh, healthy. It's, it's a great community, great developers, but they are not that many. I mean, there are very few people involved in, in, in this great, amazing job that we, everyone in the Linux world and outside of the in Linux world actually enjoy, which is the compiler, tool change, being utils, and other things uh, that actually is very few developers. So GNU compiler community, for example, do a lot of work per developer. But the question that I was wondering a few days ago is how much in terms of commits per developer? Well, here it is. So the number of commits per developer in over the his, GitHub history um, with GCC, it's around 200 commits per developer. And in the Linux kernel, it's around less than 50. So we are a very good community. We have a great community. However, it's not that many people that create all these amazing topics, all these amazing new features, all these amazing uh, things that everyone can enjoy. And the first thing that we're gonna be checking is GCC new features in terms of security. Um, one of the flags that came up in, in this new version of GCC 10, 10 that was released in, in May is FNLizer. FNLizer is an amazing thing, right? This option enables an static analysis of the program flow that looks path to uh, the source code and issues warning for the problem uh, found on this thing. So it's pretty much what we had before about, hey, I need to find a new tool to actually go and do a static analysis of my code to figure out something is wrong, like security issues, um, some other stuff that I could be forcing in the runtime to have an error. Now F Analyzer come with a proper a static analysis tool for you in the compiler. You don't have to go and search or pay for another. Of course you can go and pay, but in this case you can initially go and try with it with the F analyzer flag and see how many errors actually the GCC compiler actually find. So enable this option, effectively enable some of these warnings. So it's it's a it's a union of multiple warnings that actually enables. The, uh, things like F analyzer double F flows. Uh, um, analyzer for double free. It's going to give you a warning if you have a double free. It's going to give you a warning if you have exposure to output file, if you have a file leak, if you have a free of non heap, right? And a malloc leak. So, and there are more. I just put, put uh, six in this uh, small list, but you can see the full documentation of the GCC release notes and you will find it how many um, there are there, like more, five more. Well, the first one, um, F analyzer for double free. So F analyzer for, for double free is the diagnostics of um, warning, warnings for when you have a double free in, in your code, right? How does it look? Okay, so it looks like this. You have an, 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 a main, you have a main, and in this case, we, we ask to the memory management, hey, can you give me a pointer? Sure. Um, and then as a nice developer, I have to free that pointer because it's, it's, it's a proper thing to do. But then, of course, here is very obvious, and it just made it for an, as an example. Later, I free that pointer again. And in this case, as I said, it's very obvious, but we have seen this thing a lot of times because it, between the two, two frees, there are hundreds of lines of codes. And we as a humans, despite the fact that we're very smart, we can commit mistakes. And after 100, 200 lines of code, we say, oh, I need to uh, free my pointer. Or by the logic that we have, we free the pointer two times or three times. 
So a double free, it's, it's an issue on runtime. As we know, it's critical in terms of security. And now with this app analyzer, when we compile this basic code with uh, GCC test.c app analyzer, you will see that the warning of a double free at pointer, it's, it's pop up in, the, in, in, in your screen. So you will see actually the line codes that you will have uh, the error, free pointer and free pointer say second free here, first free at line one or point one, right? So actually it's very helpful because it's telling you where in your source code is actually the, the, the double free. Um, now it comes to a much more serious things that we can come up in, in this thing. Um, a good example is uh, the dangerous F printf. So for you mind, no or not, F printf it's evil at some point. And here we have a good example. So um, we have this thing, which is um, a main, a basic main that receive arguments. Um, we have, we declare a buffer, uh, an array of chars, and we set a string copy from whatever I pass as, as my argument to the buffer, um, passing actually the length correctly. And when the problem is that we print f uh, buffer, and we never cast to see if it's in the string or if it's, it, it, and, and the thing here is that, when we pass something that it's not actually in a string, um, something else, for example, when, after we compile this basic code and we run eight assembly that output and we pass this, this huge string actually passing a um, bunch of A's and later um, overflowing the, the, the F printf, we can see that actually start to print the stack. How do we know that? Because 41, 41, 41 is actually these A's that we, you're seeing over here. Uh, passing to ASCII. So the thing of funny here is that um, printf can be a security vulnerability for sure. There is a ton of documentation about that, how to fix it, how to how to avoid this thing with the conscious as a developer. The problem is that printf determines how many arguments it shows, get by examining the format string. If the format string doesn't agree with the actual arguments, as the example that we have here, you have undefined behavior which can manifest a security vulnerability. What kind of vulnerability? It's a form and string exploits. The attacker can perform writes to arbitrary memory address, which is very dangerous. Right, so what happened with a real code? Um, here is, uh, now we, that we know or have a little bit background about the fprintf, um, the, the fprintf is gonna go and do the same thing, but we put this inside a logger. Right? And this logger is gonna be executed by a handler. So signal as the name of this flag safe, F analyzer and safe call uh, signal handler. It's because we have a handler like this one, it's just a special function from transceive to, to actually have a, um, a, a, a signal request. It's going to say, oh, I, I have a function called handler and later inside I have an F print. GCC will detect and say, hey, wait a minute, fprintf, it's um, not properly uh, or safe, and you're also calling that from a handler. So it's the union of a really, really bad situation where you can perform a security vulnerability. So when we compile this thing and say, hey, call to printf from within signal handler, uh, it's, it's the warning that it's actually telling us. So it's telling us that the signal, sig handler, it's gonna call later to a printf here, over here, fprintf, uh, call to fprintf from within a single handler, which is a bad combination. So GCC now is that smart with this new flag to actually detect this kind of thing. It's very impressive. Um, now, extra options because you can see, okay, I have this in my compiler and me as a developer, I can say, okay, compile. But as you can imagine, uh, this is the, 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 the codes that we compile every day are not that simple and are not that easy to actually start reading all the lines that have pop-ups in the window. It's, it's, it's insane, right? So there are two extra options, F diagnostic path format separate events, um, which is going to separate the events one by one, and also F diagnostic format equal JSON. So now you can generate a JSON file at the end of your compilation file, pass process that with Python, PHP, uh, Perl, whatever you want, and later that print it in a nice dashboard. So as you can imagine, the CI/CD, uh, for example, in this case, from, from, from the previous example that we have with the bubble, bubble free, it's possible to print a JSON file 
that is telling us the line, the file, the column, the description, uh, the function, all the information that is printed on, this, on the standard output in our screen, it's, actually, it's possible to have on the JSON file. So now your application could be built and in the end, generate the JSON file, pass process that and give the warning to the developers. You can even imagine a CI CD, of course, that warns things before actually um, having it pushed to, to, the main, to the main repository, to the main branch. And it's, it's pretty healthy for, for us as developer to figure it out that we are committing a mistake in terms of security, right? And prevent that instead of going to production. Now, what it means to have these things in terms of um, next steps and real example on where to use it. Um, this is taken from a really nice uh, article, this information writing, written by um, one of good developers. So you can give the credits to developers Red Hat blog 2020, um, Static Analysis in GCC uh, 10. So I highly recommend that you go and check this blog. Um, some examples were taken from there. And in this um, blog, they mentioned something about CV that happened 15 years ago. CV 2005, uh, 1689. As you know, the CVEs are databases that are uh, for everyone outside in the open source to actually check uh, when a new security vulnerability has been detected and proven and tested, we create a new CVE uh, as a community, and now we're ready to track peaks and, uh, and post a patch. So this happened 15 years ago. Uh, it happened in Kerberos uh, version uh, five. Kerberos is a computer network authentication protocol. And the problem with that thing, when I, I double, ch I, I checked the, the CVE, in the database of, of the CVs, and the description is very straightforward. It was a double free vulnerability in the Kerberos 5 um, rec uh, B out function in MIT Kerberos 5, um, 1.4.1, and earlier allows remote attackers to execute arbitrary code by certain error conditions. So that's one of the things that we have when we have double free, right? Allow things like executing arbitrary codes uh, by double the free doubly free the, the memory, right? So in, ter in things, things uh, we have Kerberos 5. Um, and if we compile Kerberos with GC10, uh, with F analyzer flag enable, we figure out that it correctly identifies the bug with no false positives, right? The only thing that needs to be fixed is to improve the warnings without overwhelming. Of course, it could be printed to a JSON file and then post process and clean a little bit more. However, it does the thing that it's supposed to do. It helps. How does it look? Okay, now uh, you pay attention um, to this part. It in file included from, uh, and you can see the file actually installing the line. In function, rec out the common, which is the one, same one that was described on the, on the description of the CVE. Uh, double free of, uh, and then, then the, the value, right? And it is telling us here that KRB X free of the info.data, it's being freed here and then print uh, later. Now, when I checked the patch, I was looking for the patch that I was actually for this one. I was very surprised that uh, the patch for, for this one, it's exactly the, the piece of, of code that the warning on the compiler is it's telling me. So it, it, it goes and fix and into the same position that the compiler was suggesting to fix. So it, it, it matched actually that the compiler is telling us a warning and the community 15 years ago discovered the same fix and that was the fix that, that, that actually solved the issue. So this proved that this flag actually works in real environments, right? So my recommendation from this uh, first part of the presentation is let's use it in our daily um, uh, CICD, in our daily jobs, and, and try to go ahead and, and say, hey, maybe I, I should go and double check with F Analyzer with the GCC latest version and see if I'm committing a mistake or if I can find something useful or if some, a way that I can improve my code always. Now, um, the next feature that I want to talk, it's GCC new feature about profiling. Now, profiling is the best topic. And the, the, the topic that we're gonna be touching in this part is F profiling for partial training. F profiling for partial training, it's a new flag that came out with GCC 10. Uh, this flag enables that now we, the compiler can, uh, we can inform the compiler that the functions that are not executed during the profile execution 
or not exercise it during the profile execution should not be optimized. Now, what happened before this flag? Because it's important to understand what is the before and the after to have a filling of the chains that we have. So imagine that you have a code function A, function B, and function C. Now we, for the steps for profiling is we compile, we instrument your code to let the compiler later know when we execute, what are the paths that are actually being exercised? And later the compiler can optimize the paths that are much more exercised. And we will see a little bit more about profiler for developers in a period, in a minute. But I want to highlight the before and after. So before this flag came up a year ago, or two months ago, if a function A, a was not um, executed during training, then function B was not executing during the training or not exercised during the training, and function C, okay, function C is being My training means that I have a new binary that now is instrumented. I want to run a benchmark on top of this. This could be, ah, oh, I PHP. I want to run a benchmark. Python. Good. I compile Italy. Okay, let's change with the let's execute the task so that the, 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 um, the profiler have better information, much more accurate about what is the real and common case, use case for these binaries for libraries? So it will detect what function are being executed during the train. And the good thing is that once we detect that and pass back to the compiler, the compiler is going to say, hey, I'm going to optimize that function. And what happened before with a function that was not, up, not executing during your train? The compiler say, um, you know, I'm going to optimize those one, but for size, because maybe I, I, I increase a little bit the size, but I need to do something else with the other function. So, it goes straightforward and optimize this other this function, but now for size. Optimizing for size, despite the fact that it sounds pretty amazing, it has an issue. And it's that sometimes optimizing for size affect the performance of the function in terms of how much time, how much memory users you you, you how much memory uh, you're using, or the, the time of, of the execution of that function. So Optimizing for size is good for embedded things, and uh, it's good for application when the, the size matters, IoT and stuff. However, it be taken with um, caution because it's not always the rule of say, hey, I want you to optimize for size all the time. No, sometimes optimizing for size could have a penalty in terms of uh, performance. Now, what happened now with, with the F profile partial training? With the F profile partial training, the functions that are not exercised during the profiling are just ignored. As you can see, function A and B, it's just ignored. And the compiler says, hey, I did not exercise during the profiling, during the execution of the benchmark on the instrumented binary, these functions. Hmm, I'm just going to ignore it and create the same function A and B as I did before. So we have an optimized function and just the same function that was optimized before without any uh, penalization in performance or size, nothing. Of course, as you can imagine, the new binary, it's gonna be way much more heavy than the previous one, right? Now, what happened with profile guide optimization? Well, it was the thought years ago, I said, hey, why, why would it be nice if we could actually provide something to the compiler about where does it go? And the reason why I put this picture is because the best analogy that I could figure out is if you are a training of a kid soccer team and you want to improve the performance of your team, right? It's, it's a cow. It's similar to what we have in our code um, when it's running into a CPU. Multiple branches, multiple variables, multiple paths, and, and of course one instruction pointer, which in this case will be the ball that it's go, how does it go? But it's an analogy that I want to, to propose to you about how this profile guide optimization works. So to extract good performance out of the program, it will be nice if programmers could provide hints of annotation to the compiler and say, hey, compiler, I get the, the idea of where is it going and the, the, the binary is being executed more into this path and never actually taking this other path. So PGO is a method used by compilers to produce optimal code by using application runtime data. Because this data come out from directly from the application, the compiler can make much more accurate guesses. So it's giving a hint to the compiler and say, hey, actually, 
you should go, we go most of the time during runtime for DSpy. Oh, great. So the compiler now can optimize better. And we will see what kind of optimization could happen. Uh, profile um, uh, optimizations have has three stages. The compilation of an instrumented binary, the profile execution, and the compile optimization. And the reason why I put the picture before is, imagine that you're the coach of the soccer game, and you want to know, uh, the soccer team, and you want to know which one of the, of the players actually run more, which one run less, and so on. But you lack of technology, you have a drone on top of that, and, and it's very complicated, expensive, and you have uh, extra virtual reality technology, yeah, it's not. So a solution that we were going to propose is going to put a huge cry on the, on the back of, of each one of the players, and we are going to make it uh, to run, and it's going to pain over, over um, the, the field. Uh, where does it go, right? Or a lot of uh, paint um, can in the back, and it's going to get, let me know actually where, where it was, was each player it's going. Or if a player is it's stuck in one place and never running, right? So it's, it's going to be at the end a picture of the field. And, and, and let me know good information. That's, that's an analogy for how does PGO work. Now, the first part is I have to put this huge pane into the back of the, of the player. And as you can imagine, the player is not going to run the same speed. Why? Because it's heavy. That happens the same with instrumentation. Instrumentation produces an executable that now has counters. And every time that we take a branch, it's going to increase the counter. Take another against the branch increase the counter again, go for the branch, increase the counter again. And um, it's gonna happen for branches, blocks, in, uh, variables. So it, each proofs, which sensors, count the numbers of times of a basic block runs. If the block is a branch, the proof records the direct taken by that branch. How do I generate this for? So it's very simple. You have your application uh, code. So you're gonna compile as GCC, app profile generate, and the profile directly. Here is where, where all the GCDA files, that is going to be the extension that is going to be generated, are going to be um, saved or recorded, right? Uh, the second one is, okay, I now that I put in my player sensors or groups, go and play, great. Um, it's going to be way, way much more uh, slow because the groups are heavy in the back of the players. Now, with the profile execution, it's, um, you have to simulate the most um, the real conditions. So what I have to do, bring in a team or um, uh, a friend team that tell me to, to actually go and get the, the, the photo of where my, my team is failing or where, where can I improve my, my team. So the profile execution actually is an execution of a benchmark or a regular basic um, application for the daily test cases that we execute at the end, right? So when it's executed, the instrumented program generates a data that a file that contains the execution counts for the specific run of the program. So it's going to leave a path of where each one of the players is actually going. And the compile optimization part, now that we have uh, the pane on, on the field, we can go and now take the picture, pound, and I can have the picture and say, okay, so player green, yellow, and red are not moving, blue it's moving only to the left, and purple it's moving only to the corner but it's in the top. Okay, that's great. So now I can analyze my data that's recent of this picture and actually go and think about how can I improve my, my team, right? So information from the profile execution of program is feedback to the compiler. The compiler now doesn't have to hint that much. And the data is used to make a better estimated of the program from the flow. The compiler uses the information to reproduce the executable file, relying on this data rather than the statistic heuristics. So uh, the GCC in the end, it's going to say, hey, GCC, app profile, use, and you pass the data, the directory you want to work where all the GCDA has been to do. All these could be appended, yes. So can you run multiple benchmark and information will be appended? Yes. However, uh, there are a few things that we will check in a minute. Um, it's not sometimes very good idea to append that much data. So uh, we will check that in a minute. But before, what kind of optimization should I expect uh, once that I have all these jobs? Well, the first one is function in line. Function is lining a technology that has been with us for, for a long time in the compiler. It's a technique where the in, we inline high frequency function into one of the calling functions to reduce function overheads. The idea of function in line is to reduce the, the, 
the use of um, the call overheads to many functions, which will of course reduce the amount of cache that you might gonna need. Um, remember that you, you're gonna need memory to, to move from one function to another and so on. So the less, the less amount of memory is also pretty important for the performance of an application. Let's take, take it as an example as this one. We have function A, which is gonna be our main function. And it could go into, we have an if and else, and it could go into function B or C. And function B could go into function D or E, or in function C, it could go into a function F and J, based on the um, condition that they could define. This could be a counter, this could be a Boolean, an income, an external uh, database injection, whatever you want, that it could split the branch of the execution. Now, 70 times are from A, it's going to be and only 30 times it's going to C. When you are in function B, 80 times it's going to function D, and 20 times it's going to function E. Um, and from C, we go 90 times to function F, and only 10 times to function D. If the amount will be 100 uh, in terms of portion, as we can see that um, most of the times function A go to function B, and function B most of the time goes to function D, Function C most of the times go to function F. Now, inline fun function aligning, it's gonna go and merge the function that are very tight and most of the time one call the other. So in this case, B and D could be aligned. Uh, C could be aligned to F and very risky A could be aligned to B, right? So in, um, that will reduce the amount of um, uh, function call overheads on, on the execution of your binary. The next one, and this could happen if we pass the PGO profile data optimization back to the compiler. Compaction, the compiler actually can figure out, say, hey, most of the time you go from this function to this function and you from C to F. So I'm going to try to inline these functions. Now, block ordering. The second part that could be improved is block ordering. The compiler would aim to achieve all locally to perform minimum amount of memory operation. Functions which are hard. Um, highly bound should be collocated to minimize instruction cleavage. Sometimes we said, oh, I'm, I have my code, I'm just compile and let the compiler do the magic and we forget what's happening behind the scenes. Well, behind the scenes, the compiler has to figure it out on the text sides and um, how and, and arrange a text data heap. Um, how does it work in terms of doing much more efficient? Let's take into the example this one. Uh, function A, we have Function A, if condition is equal to true, and it's going to call function B, else it's going to call function uh, C. And at the end, uh, function B, it's going to be calling function B. So we can figure out more or less the idea. We have A, it's going to call function B if it's true, or call, call function C. And function B, it's going to call uh, function D, right? Now, what happened? If most of the time we realize that the condition, it's always false because it's um, for some reason or, or during the training of our file guide optimization, most of the times the conditions were false. Well, we rearrange things and say, you know, A now it's going to call C immediately. C it's going to call, uh, and, and A it's going to call B sometimes, but B it's going to be closer to D. Right, so here before, B was very far, far away from B, and C was far, far away from, from uh, A. Now, A is closer from C, and B is closer to B. This is because we have block reordering based on the information that we get from the profile guide instrumentation during the training, right? And the third one, it's gonna be the dead code elimination. That code elimination is an optimization that removes code that it does not affect the program result. It's important to differentiate from that code elimination to unreachable code. That code is code that it's, despite the fact that it could be executed, it will not affect the end result of what we have. So it's gonna consider a waste of CPU performance. And when you are trying to increase the performance, every single step matters. Every single step matters. Every bottleneck that you fix, it's a fair thing for your application. So a good example, uh, well, in the other case, a reachable code is the code that will never be reached. It doesn't matter, it's, it's like you said, okay, if condition equal true, and condition you defined by before as true, it always goes into that branch. Else, do something else. You know that it will never reach that else, because condition was hard-coded to be true. 
right? That is a reachable code. That can code that will never be reached regardless of the logic flow. Um, the difference is it's not executed. It's never executed. However, the dead code is executed and it's dangerous. So what we want to eliminate is dead code, not a reachable code in the beginning, but uh, the dead code, uh, it's, it's much more dangerous. Um, now, the dead code, it's, um, here is a good example. We have a function foo, we have um, in x and in y, and then re return a, and a it's equal one here. And before we had a equal x plus y, and later redefine, reassign uh, one to a. So it doesn't matter what value that we pass, a will always be one. So this is that code. This over here, red, is an example of that code because it will never be, um, despite the fact that it's executed, it, the result will never change between one and this function. So it's a waste of CPU uh, cycles and performance. So with the profile guide of optimization, now compiler knows, hey, you know, uh, actually, if this function is highly executed and I can figure out that are codes that it will, um, despite the fact that I executed, will never change the result based on the training that I have, I'm just going to remove that code, okay? So it's very interesting that that code elimination is it's being performed. There is another flag that you can actually exercise that is not based on profile guide optimization, which is FDCE. Uh, it's, it's the dead code elimination for profile guide optimization. It's similar to this one, but with runtime information. This one only gets the dead code elimination by PGO actually knows that, uh, that this is a waste of CPU, right? Now, next steps on real example and where to use it. If the application behaves, something important you have to have in your mind and say, hey, this is magic, I'm gonna use it most of the time. Well, be careful. If the application behaves differently for uh, different data sets, it's possible to have a performance regression. We have had examples where we have executed one benchmark and then we append another benchmark, another one, and surprise, the performance is worse than the original. Why? Because we're trying that the compiler guess multiple paths and the compiler could get races, hey, you first let me know that the condition was always true and then condition was false. I don't know at this point. So define what, what is gonna be the common scenario that it's really close to uh, the how the application should behave in the needs in production, right? For large applications that are run frequently, it is observed that PGOs can provide, uh, can prove to be a significant source of performance. So, Example of that is Python. I don't already provide this option. So Python goes, uh, in terms of development, very ahead um, of how to use more the technology to compiler. And you can compile Python by yourself and put it into your path. And you compile with Python, configure flags, enable optimization, and make profile OPT and SMPT flags. This profile, um, dash opt compile the, the the python source code into again but using pgo so inside this this make file you will see that the three steps that we saw before which are um compile instrumentation profile execution and compile optimization sure the time that your python is going to be uh taking to compile is going to increase because we are actually running a benchmark what we did in clear was modifying the, the a very simple flag and a variable, sorry, and define what is gonna be the training model that we want to optimize for. So I encourage you that if you want to optimize your Python, select before in that patch what, you, uh, what training model do you want to use so that you will be optimizing for your application. And the steps are gonna be very simple. Uh, build, run the benchmark, and recompile. That is what happened inside the make profile application. Next thing is something new. B, the dynamic range of BigFloat 16, it's greater than the floating point 16. A little bit of history. Floating uh, BigFloat 16, um, it's going to have one bit for sine, eight bits for exponent, and seven bits for diffraction in this instance. Uh, the float 32 that we are used to when we have a long float a number, it's going to have one sign, uh, one bit for sign, eight bit for uh, the exponent, and 23 more for the fraction of a that we want to, to, to use, right? The, in the history, people said, ah, I don't need that much precision. I'm going to uh, split the, the registry of, 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 uh, of the floating point for uh, just using 60, 16 
bytes, uh, bits in terms of 32. Right, um, bfloat16, it's a range used that changes because before for float16, it was using five bits and 10 bits. Now it's going to be using eight bits and seven bits. Now, the bfloat16 range is used for things like ratings that can outside the dynamic of for machine learning and, and it's better but at float16. Um, it requires low scaling, uh, but bflow 16 can represent source grading straightforward. In addition to that, the, something good, you can use bflow 16 format to accurately represent all integers um, from minus 256 to 256, which means that you can encode integer A in uh, bflow uh, 16 uh, without lose of accuracy, which is a good idea. So, Cooper Lake. This new platform that is coming in the in the in the compiler uh, with MRG called Cooper Lake enable these kind of things with three different new instructions. Now, what kind of instructions we have? It's split it into two kind of, of, of uh, operation on the ISA. One is going to be for FMA fuse multiplication addition of two bfloat 16 input operands, and the other one will be conversion between floating point 32 and bfloat 16 because it's important. There might be the case that your application is uh, expecting be floating, uh, floating point 32, and you want to perform actually the instruction on hardware with bfloat 16. Well, on the list of Intel ABX 412 bfloat 16 vectoral neural instruction includes um, these uh, three instructions, which is bct to p uh, to bfloat 16. As you can see, it says two bfloat 16, two bfloat 16, and it's going to be two precision single or uh, precision single, right? And this one. Two precision single means because it's doing the conversion of two packet single data um, to one packet data, uh, data, two packet single data uh, to bfloat 16. And here it's converting packet single data to bfloat 16. So that's the reason of this acronym. And it's a kind of conversion. On the last one, it's uh, bfloat 16 PS. It's the, it's the dot product of bfloat 16 first accumulating into package single precision. Right. So remember, uh, the fuse multiplication addition is the core um, instruction for matrix multiplication that you can go and take two elements, multiply them, and then add them to the accumulation that was before into the third element. So it's going to receive three elements. All these instruction could be performed in a registry of 128 bits, 256 bits and 512 bit mode. So software developers can define the, the level that they prefer and the use that they prefer. Uh, they don't want to say, hey, I want to use uh, all the full 512 register. I want to use, um, which is a CDMM register. I want to use a much more shorter register on XMM or YMM. It's, it's okay for them. As long as it's inside a Cooper Lake platform because the Cooper Lake platform is the only one that support these instructions. Uh, FMA with bfloat16 is going to take as an input the bfloat16 source1 and source2 and the source destination is going to be a floating point 32 do the multiplication and addition in one single operation um, uh, and, and, and of course the number of cycles will be less than if you do that separately in addition and then multiplication moving the things uh, from a rate to register, registry way much more expensive in terms of performance and power actual execution that you want to use. Uh, this unit takes two bfloat 16 values and multiply, multiply and adds them in, and it will be extended to floating point 32 numbers with the lower 16 bits set to zero. Uh, the bfloat 16 multiplication is performing without loss of precision, that is important. It result is passed to a general floating point 32 accumulator with the um, a form of settings, right? So in the end, you will have the source destination have a floating point 32, and that is a cool because you actually have a good precision by exercising the bfloat 16. Example in code, uh, you can click here for a full example of repository that I have. It's gonna have, uh, how do I use this instruction in my code in C? Well, the good thing is that we have intrinsics. So in intrinsics, it's uh, translated to uh, cbtnaps tbh, and then you pass the, the register that you want to convert, or with the, the two registries that you want to convert also, convert packet of single precision 32 bits floating point elements in two vectors A and B uh, to packet B float 16, floating point element, and then store the results in the single vector destination, right? 
And the last one, the flow fierce multiplication addition that we saw, we have A and B and source, and it's going to be doing the multiplication of A and B and addition to source. Now, how does it look in, in terms of a demo? Taking the last one, uh, we're going to multiply A times B and then add back to A. And if A and B, um, it's going to be 10 and 6, it's going to be 10 multiplied by 6 and then add that plus A. And as you can see in the result, we have um, 70, which is the result of 10 times 6, which is 16, plus 10, it's going to be 70. So it works. It actually works the, the, the instructions that we want to, to perform with B flow 16. Um, how do I manage to move to a new tool change in this extreme, extremely rapid world that requesting super fast and production in two, three weeks and all containers, cloud, and super um, straightforward? Well, the recommendation that I have to you is take it easy, take a breath. Moving from one compiler to another, it's definitely not something that you can take as a, as a joke and say, yeah, that morning I'm going to do it in one hour. No, no, take it easy. Be very uh, uh, conscious about what you're going to do because it could affect you a lot in future problems. So, but if you manage correctly, it could go as straightforward and enjoy all the benefits of the new feature. First the thing that you want, you need to do is build a new GCC. In this case, we're going to the focus to the compiler. It's a different story for GLibc, um, but we will focus for now, just for the compiler. Download the, comp the tarball uh, from wherever you want. If you say you want to download it, that version, good for you. You want to, you want to use GCC 9, GCC 10, GCC 8, according to the version you want to go. Um, then download the prerequisites. Something very interesting about GCC is that they always uh, have a form, form to go and dash country download for requisites. It's very interesting. Go and check what they do and actually install the things that they need to compile. It's not that many. Don't, don't believe it's going to be full, uh, your computer with garbage. No. Uh, create a build directory. Um, we're going to get out from the repository, from, from the inside the repository, one step back, create GCC build or whatever you want to put into the name. Go back into the GCC build. And then start first to configure, make, and make install. Now, here comes the tricky part. Configure will require some specific flags for your consideration that with my personal story, I was stepping my head in, into the wall and saying, why it's not compiling, why it's not compiling? Well, because I was missing some of these important things. So to save you time of that, uh, pumping your head in, into, the, into the wall and saying, hey, what am I missing? What am I missing? Here is the, re the receipt that works for me that I hope that works for you. Um, the source code of the this script, it's, it's there in, in, in my, my personal GitHub repository. And it's very simple. I'm just going to explain uh, a bit. So we specify a prefix. Where do you want to install your new GCC, right? Do you want to install just to test it in the middle um, in, in user local or them? You, you define your prefix. Enable share, it's for sure mandatory. We live in a share world. It's very rare that you have a static. Um, world where all the libraries are need to be compiled statically, you need to be shared and, and loaded, think it dynamically. So that's for, for sure. Enable system CDLE. This is important because in terms of performance, it will help you to, to improve the, the compression size. And you, if you think that your system, it's way much more in terms of CDLE, it has better performance than the one that it's preloaded with GCC, go ahead and with, set with system CDLE because it will improve the performance quite well. Um, the num the enable the kind of threads, uh, as we know, we have different kind of um, threads uh, um, formats. Uh, but the POSIX is the most much, much more used one. So this is the one that I use in, in all my Linux uh, machines. So enable threads equal POSIX. If you have any specific needs, in the documentation of enable threads for configuring the C, you will find all the possible configuration that you can use. Uh, for the ethics, it's when you clean out the function and how do you clean up properly the memory. Um, enable uh, collocate continue. Uh, again, there are multiple versions. For us, it's going to be the mandatory or recommended to you. Enable language. And this will save you a lot of time. It's, you just need C, C++, Fortran. That's good enough. If you don't need any other thing else, for all the language that the GNU uh, compiler collection, that's the reason why it's called GCC, GNU compiler collection. Because in the beginning it was just for C, now it was C++, Fortran, Go, and other things. So 
Um, I highly recommend that you do not put here all and specify straightforward which one do you need. And after that, just go make and make install. We go into and install into the install that we specified before. Here are some examples um, or description about uh, just for the record about what does each one of, of these one uh, do. Um, and but it, and 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 again also another one that you want to put over here it's disable multi -lead. Disable multi-leave, it's very important. This parameter ensures that they are created for the specific architecture. This was the one that I was pumping my head because you will see an error, something that say, hey, compiler build fails with fatal error. You need to stop 32.h, not to file directly. If you're like me in a 64-bit system, it's supposed to have the leave C uh, that you want to compile. So remember, the compiler will require libraries to do it, and those libraries are going to be in glibc. So if you are asking, you, you don't disable multi leaf or disable multi arc, it will just go and build for multiple architecture and for multiple uh, libraries definitions. So it will build for 32 and 64. And when it goes and build for 32 and say, hey, I don't have the libraries for 32 bits and it's gonna fail horrible. So please disable multi leaf or disable multi arc also highly recommended all, all the the script, it's, it's put it there, so it's the one that I use, and disable both. So if it works for you, I'm happy to share. Um, now, now that I have my, my GCC, uh, what I do is I put into, uh, in my personal experience, what we have here in clear, at least, it's uh, we use um, mock and we use Koji. So um, you can use other options if you're using Debian or it's, uh, to say or according to your um, architecture and your, your build system, up to you. But the idea is you have a new compiler and what you have to do is compile all the minimum packages to create a new image and say, okay, um, I'm gonna grab, um, okay, and now I'm gonna grab the new compiler, the, 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 the source code of the compiler. Um, does it compile okay with the new compiler? Yes, okay. So I'm gonna put that in, a, in, in my new repo my local repo, I'm gonna tell my mock and say, hey, use please this one. Mock's gonna go and check, hey, do I have a new version of the, of the compiler? Yes, I'm gonna use it. Okay, so in this one is redundant, but it's gonna happen with the kernel, glibc, TCL, spec, and courses, bash, or utils, get text, rep, gc, and for make, patch, virtual set, and tar. Another important ones that you might think uh, in the beginning and that it's useful. This list is the minimal package to build a Linux system taking from Linux from scratch, which is a great source. And I just added system D because you know system D is um, important to rebuild. And once you start to rebuild, uh, of course, when you rebuild, you're gonna need sometimes bash, get text, rep. It's mock is gonna take from the old one, all packages. The idea is that in the end, you grow that much this local repo that it's similar to this one. And when the new, when you build a new thing like hello world or a test case. It's gonna go and grab instead of from the old packages, the new packages. It's good to the version is gonna be changing in this part when you when you create into your build system, try to create the version so that mock take the latest one and compile with the new uh, uh, packages here. In the end, if there is a uh, an issue and does not compile compile okay, well, it's time to debug. What happened a few weeks ago? We we have by ethno common many mistakes. We have to go grab the patch, fix it, or apply ethno common. Uh, F common and, and, and keep moving. But in the end, it was the recompile of the minimum. What are the minimum systems that you need to rebuild? Um, the recommendation is to rebuild the, the full uh, distro um, in these terms. However, if you want to build your application statically with new features for GCC, up to you. You don't have to, of course, build, build the, the full stuff, but be cautious about future problems that might help. So it's not a role of you have to but it's recommended that you reveal uh, as much package as you, you're gonna be using in this part. Where can I ask for help? If you are um, with a lot of problems, top of your head, GCC provides supporting to GCC documentation. Go and check, it's very well documented. The people and maintainers that figured out there is an issue with their new things, go and po post uh, how to do the porting to the new GCC. GCC help mail list, there is a specific mail list where people ask and ask and ask and they get pretty good answers about how to fix their issue. Uh, GLibc mail list for, pack, for packaging problems and GLibc also mentioned that they have a new mail list for the package problem. So if there is an issue, they can post it over there into the main list, right? In summary, um, the toolchain is simply 
tool to build software, compiler, assembly, linker, libraries, and few useful you. We delete this, and that was taken actually from internet from a definition of what is a tool chain. The answer is no, it's not entirely true. Actually, the tool chain is a set of optimized tools to build better software. It's like um, all, let's see, like in this picture, we have a lot of tools that are, are optimized to build better software for you. We are in the tool chain team. The, the, our goal is to create you tools that help you to create better software with better performance, with higher security, with better code, with less errors for your end user. We are happy when you as a community success with our tools that we create for you. So let's use it and have fun with this. Thank you so much. Have a great day and now we're open for any question. Thank you.